So thank you for coming out on this um, unpleasant evening in November. Uh, uh, this is the building that I work at. Um, have I got a pointer that I can use here? Yeah, so this, this is the, the green building, the old, old road campus research building on the old road campus at the Churchill Hospital site, and that's where my research labs are based. So we're going to be talking about um, improved influenza vaccines, but first a little bit about the institute that I work for, uh, the Jenner Institute, obviously named after Edward Jenner, uh, who is famous for vaccinating his gardener's son, James Phipps, with cowpox taken from a pustule on a milkmaid's hand. Um, he, he wasn't the first person to do this. It had been done previously. He'd heard about other people doing it as well. He was the first person to do this and then test if this method of vaccination, this method of disease prevention would actually work because it subsequently exposed the boy to smallpox. Uh, and that was not quite as radical as it might sound to us these days because actually um, the process of variolation of deliberately in introducing the smallpox virus into the skin uh, to give a, a, an infection which hopefully the body would produce an immune response and be able to control. That was something that was done quite widely when there were smallpox outbreaks. It was dangerous. It had a death rate of about 2%. But if you survived variolation, then you did become immune to smallpox. Um, Jenner wanted to replace this very dangerous practice of using live smallpox to immunize people by replacing it with something safer. So he replaced it with a, a related virus, the cowpox virus, uh, and he was able to show that this didn't cause a, a, a very dangerous infection in the child that he vaccinated, but subsequently that child, when exposed to smallpox, was protected against it. And importantly, he went on to publicise his findings. He presented them at the Royal Society. He um, publicised the, the finding that we could have a much safer way of presenting, preventing smallpox um, in the population of England uh, and prevent further smallpox outbreaks. And 200 years later, smallpox was eradicated. So he, he did some very important early work. And we try to continue in his footsteps by working on diseases that make a real difference to global health. So at our institute, we have people working on HIV, TB, malaria, dengue, and I work on flu and pandemic flu vaccine development. We are, we are not uh, a purely research lab-based institute. We do a lot of what we call translational research. We try to get our vaccines into clinical trials and test them in people as quickly as possible. We're not really interested in developing vaccines that are great for stopping rabbits getting HIV. That's not, you have to do that kind of research as part of the process. Some people just continue with that kind of work for their whole scientific career. What we're trying to do is get vaccines into people as quickly as possible, test if they're safe, test if they produce the immune responses that we want, and then test if they're effective. And that's the focus of our research. And we're also interested in vaccines for other animals, livestock animals, as well as humans. Remember that most new diseases come out of um, so-called zoonotic infections. A disease will transfer from some animal species and start causing infections in humans. That's the case with Ebola virus. Its, its native host is the fruit bat, but it can cross into humans and it can infect them. And if we can have better vaccines for animals, if we can protect pigs better against swine flu, we protect ourselves as well because then we don't get exposed to pigs that have got swine flu and we've got less chance of having uh, picking up virus infections from a pig. So that's all part of the focus of the Jenner Institute as well. So this is another artist impression, this time an artist impression of uh, our target, the influenza virus. And here what we're looking at is a cross section of the virus. So it's a very small ball. The surface of the ball is studied with mainly two different proteins, which are called the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. So if you think of a, a complete spherical ball studied with these proteins, when that virus comes into our bodies, the virus can only see what's on the outside of this virus. Uh, sorry, the immune system can only see what's on the outside of this virus. Everything that's in here is hidden away when the virus first enters the body. But there are proteins in here that we can still make immune responses to. So this protein that goes all the way around the shell of the virus here and forms this, this um, core, this is called matrix protein 1. Uh, these loops here are the segments of the nucleic acid of the, the virus, the genetic material. It's RNA in the case of influenza virus. It has 11 separate segments. And to stabilize this RNA, this is complex with another protein, which is called nuclear protein. And I'll come back to matrix protein 1 and nuclear protein a bit later on in the talk. So these are hidden away on the inside of the virus, and on the outside of the virus we have the hemagglutinin that is accessible by antibodies that are in the body as soon as the virus enters the body. And it can't get to the things that are inside. 
So there are two classical methods for making vaccines against infectious diseases. One is to grow the pathogen that you're interested in and inactivate it, you know, vaccinate with that, so that the inactivated pathogen can't cause disease, but we give our bodies a chance to make an immune response against it. And the other one is attenuation, where we use a live vaccine, but we've modified it in some way so that it doesn't cause disease, it still causes infection, but it doesn't cause pathology. So we have both types of approach that have been taken to make licensed influenza vaccines. So the ones that are most widely used are the inactivated influenza vaccines. Now, in order to make these, um, the WHO provides seed stocks which have the, the hemagglutinin, that's the H, and the neuraminidase, the N, of the most recently circulating flu viruses. Those are provided to manufacturers, and they grow those viruses in embryonated eggs. Remember that a virus can't reproduce itself. It can only make further copies of itself if it infects a cell, the right type, uh, and makes copies inside that cell, and then the, the, the new viruses leave that cell and can go on to infect other cells. So you can't just grow viruses in culture without providing it with a cell to replicate in, and we can use embryonated chicken eggs for this purpose. And we can get quite high titer preps, lots and lots of virus out of embryonated chicken eggs. And these are then inactivated, chemically inactivated with formaldehyde, disrupted with detergent to break up the virions. So we've got the individual proteins from the virus and then they're adjusted so that we have standard amount of hemagglutinin in, in each dose of the vaccine. And that's what gets injected into people. There's no adjuvant used in most flu vaccines. It's just the um, inactivated and split virus adjusted to contain a standard amount of hemagglutinin. The difficulty with using inactivated influenza vaccines is that there's continual change in the proteins on the surface of the virus. There are two different mechanisms which result in different flu viruses circulating. One is called antigenic drift, and that's a slow process over time of mutations gradually accumulating. RNA viruses are notorious for changing slightly all the time, um, and we get slightly different sequences produced in the hemagglutinin, uh, and the immune response that we had to last year's virus won't protect us against next year's virus. Shift is a more dramatic change. Shift is when we change to a completely different type of hemagglutinin. So when we had um, the H1N1 uh, pandemic, um, or when we sw switch from H1N1 to H2N2, as happened uh, earlier in the last century, that's, that's a major change in the antigenicity of the virus, rather than a slow, gradual accumulation over time of mutations that causes antigenic drift. So because of antigenic drift, we have to complete, keep updating the composition of the virus. And this is what the WHO does. It surveys the viruses that are circulating each year. And for each flu season, it has a meeting for the Northern Hemisphere to announce what will be in the vaccine and one six months later for the Southern Hemisphere. And they have been choosing three different viruses to go into these vaccines to make the so-called trivalent inactivated vaccine. So one H1N1, one H3N2 and one flu B strain. And in 2005 at six season, they had to change the H3N2 component from the year before. And the following year, they had to change it again, and they had to change flu B as well. And then the next year, they had to change the H1N1 component. And you can see all the ones in red are where they had to introduce a change. And this goes on all the time. Uh, so this year, we have a vaccine composition that's still the, nine, the 2009 pandemic-like virus for the H1 component. Um, it's a change in the H3 component from last year. It was last changed um, two years ago, had to be changed again this year. Uh, the B virus didn't change. B viruses now exist in two distinct lineages, and they're not very similar. And the WHO each year has been deciding which version of the B virus to put into the vaccine. And actually, over the last 10 years, half the time, it's been the wrong B virus in the vaccine. The, the, the virus has been circulating, causing disease in the following season. And remember that WHO have to predict a year in advance what's going to happen. And 50% uh, of the time recently, it's been the wrong one. So they've now said, well, we'll put them both in. We'll have a quadrivalent vaccine that has both types of flu B virus in the vaccine, and then we covered for both of them. So manufacturers now have the choice of making a trivalent vaccine with these three in, or if they want to make a quadrivalent formulation, which should be more effective against B, depending on what virus circulates, they can add in this one as well. So every year, the vaccine manufacturers have to get their new seed stocks from the WHO. They have to start manufacturing. They have to do a small clinical trial to make sure that they're getting immune responses to all the components of the vaccine in people under the age of 50 and people over the age of 50. They have to satisfy certain criteria before they're, used, uh, before they're able to use those vaccines. And then everybody has to be vaccinated. Uh, and this has to happen again the next year and again the year after that because 
the antigenic drift will re result in needing to change these all of the time. However, if we have a pandemic, if a different flu virus that's not related to these, not derived from these viruses, starts to circulate, these vaccines do nothing at all because the pandemic virus is very different in its hemagglutinin and these vaccines will not produce an immune response that protects us against pandemic virus. So we need to know exactly what the pandemic virus is and then it will probably take about six months to have a large number of doses of that vaccine ready to use. We can't predict what any pandemic is going to be um, and it was really a big surprise that the 2009 pandemic was an H1N1 virus. Um, and so we have to wait and see what virus does cause a pandemic and then start to make the vaccine. So this isn't a very good situation to be in. As I said, we also have attenuated vaccines for flu. And this is the live attenuated influenza virus or flu mist made by Medimmune, now owned by AstraZeneca. This is produced from a so-called master donor virus, which is a flu virus, which can only grow at lower temperatures than in our body. It can only grow at the temperature that we have in our nose, which is about 34 degrees, rather than the temperature that we have in most of our body, which is about 37 degrees. So the master donor virus is given the appropriate hemagglutin and neuraminidase sequences from the recently circulating viruses. And then this live virus is grown, and it's administered by nasal spray into the nose. So this is the, the vaccine that's now being used in children in the UK. And in young children, under the age of about nine years, it has a very high level of efficacy. No vaccine is ever 100% effective, but this 85 to 90% in young children is a very high level of efficacy. And it's a very good vaccine to use for young children because it gives them slightly broader immunity than the, uh, the inactivated vaccines. It's also a nasal spray rather than requiring uh, an injection. Unfortunately, in older people, even in older children who've already been exposed to flu by natural exposure a number of times, these live attenuated vaccines don't really do anything at all. They don't seem to add anything. So that's why they're not being offered to older people. It's only been possible really to demonstrate efficacy in people under the age of 18 years. So if you want a better vaccine for use in older people, this is not the place to look. It's a great vaccine for young children and there may be some benefit in vaccinating children to the older parts of the population because children tend to shed a lot of virus. If they get flu, they produce lots of virus. They spread it around to everybody they come into contact with. So if we can get all the young children vaccinated, we should be able to reduce the amount of flu virus that's circulating in the population. And that could have a knock-on benefit to older people because they're less likely to be exposed to the flu virus. But this vaccine doesn't work directly in older people. So why do we need new flu vaccines? Well, as I've said, the existing vaccines focus the immune responses on the parts of the virus that keep changing all the time. So we have to keep changing the vaccine. So the antigenic drift means that the virus changes all the time, the vaccine has to be changed again to keep up, and everybody has to be revaccinated. Unfortunately, the vaccines are less effective in the, in the target population that needs it most. That's the over 65s. Vaccine efficacy of the inactivated vaccines is thought to be around 60% in people um, under the age of 60. Over the age of 60, it's more like 30 to 40%. Uh, and there isn't very much that we can do about that. Uh, and as I said, if there is a new pandemic, we have to have a different vaccine and we can't make it fast enough to protect everybody. So this, we have a partially effective vaccine that's been widely used. It does provide benefits, but there are clearly opportunities for improving on this. So what else could we do? So here's the picture of the flu virus again. And I told you that the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase on the outside that can be attacked by antibodies uh, change all the time. But not every part of the flu virus changes all the time. There are some parts that really stay the same between all the different flu viruses in people and in birds. And the major reservoir of influenza viruses in migratory birds. That's, that's where we find most flu viruses in the world. It's not really a human disease. It's an avian disease. So if we could make a vaccine that produced an immune response to target the parts of the virus that don't keep changing, we wouldn't need to keep changing the vaccine. It would work against all the years of seasonal flu viruses. It would work against pandemic viruses. Uh, and we wouldn't have to keep making new vaccines every time. We may need to revaccinate to maintain the immune response, but we wouldn't need to keep making a new formulation of the vaccine and giving it every single year to everybody that we want to try to protect. So which bits could we look at? Well, if we look at the immune response to flu in somebody who's had flu and recovered, it's not just antibody responses to the, to the antigens that we're currently using in vaccines. We see, anti, we see antibody responses against other parts of the virus, this so-called M2E region, this little bit of the matrix protein 2 that sticks out. Um, 
uh, we get antibodies against the so-called stalk of the hemagglutinin, this bit that's closer to the center of the virus. This doesn't change very much. And what's very well conserved are the proteins on the inside of the virus that the antibodies can't reach. So this matrix protein one around the outside and the nuclear protein that's required to complex to and stabilize the RNA. So all of those are part of naturally acquired immunity. We don't really know which is most important in protecting us against flu, and they're not induced by existing vaccines. So we need to think about how we can make a different type of vaccine that will give us these responses against the conserved antigens so we don't need to keep changing the vaccine composition. But is there any hope that if we could do that, it would work? Well, we know that in a pandemic, when a new virus starts to circulate, uh, and in theory, the modelers would have it, that everybody is susceptible to that virus. But in reality, only a low percent percentage of those infections are fatal. Even in 1918, the horrendous pandemic in 1918 that killed 40 million people, only 2% of the, po the people who were infected died from that infection. 40 million died because practically everybody in the world got infected. It was a very efficient virus in spreading. But some people um, in any pandemic become, some die, a minority. Some become seriously ill but then completely recover. Some have a mild illness, no worse than seasonal flu is. And some people don't even know they've been infected. And we can only find out they've been infected by taking blood samples from them and finding that they do have antibodies to the pandemic virus, and yet they don't know that they've been ill. So in a pandemic, it's not true that everybody is going to be susceptible and everybody is going to get very severe disease if they're infected. And we also know that people who've recently had seasonal influenza are less likely to become ill when a pandemic starts. And we believe that to be because the seasonal influenza infection that they had gave them some naturally acquired immunity against the, the seasonal flu virus, but that includes parts of the virus that don't change between the seasonal virus and the pandemic virus. So that part of their immune response can protect them against the pandemic virus. And that's what we would like to try to induce by vaccination. So there are two main approaches for doing this. I told you that the stalk of the hemagglutinin, the part closest to the center of the virus, doesn't change very much. So this is a different representation of the hemagglutinin molecule. It's a trimer. It consists of three identical molecules that fit together. This is a picture of one of those molecules. And the green part is what we call the stalk. This attaches it down here to the center of the virus. And the red part on here is the head. And this is the part that changes. It's very, very variable. Uh, and if we have antibodies against one version of this head, it will only work against that version. It won't work against any other versions of the head. But because the stalk doesn't change very much, if we can make antibodies against that, that will neutralize the virus and prevent infection, then potentially we should be able to have protection against lots and lots of viruses. We do get anti-stalk antibodies in naturally acquired immune responses, but they're very, very low level responses. And immune responses to the hemagglutin are dominated by responses to this very variable head. So we need to find ways of redirecting the immune response against the part that we want to recognize, the part that doesn't change, and not against this head where they will only work against one specific influenza virus. So if the whole of the hemagglutin is present in the vaccine, most of the response is against the head. And that's a very specific response against one virus, it doesn't help us against different viruses. So people have been thinking of ways of just using the stalk to make vaccines. Uh, and this diagram represents different ways people have thought about doing this. So just chopping off the head. Well, that can be done chemically. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> the molecule that's produced is very um, chemically unstable. It just falls apart. If you try to vaccinate with it, you haven't really got anything that gives you a good immune response. So another approach is to, is to remove the head, but add a protein linker that joins together the two parts of the stalk in an attempt to make this more stable. It does include, in, then introduce some different sequences that wouldn't normally be in the flu virus, and we might get antibodies against those, which wouldn't be helpful. You could just use one of these regions of the stalk. Um, that could be produced and is chemically much more stable, but it's only one very small part of the stalk and might not give us a very good immune response. So the approach that's been most successful so far is to use um, a, a stalk uh, that is the same as a seasonal flu virus with a head that is from a different virus that our immune system doesn't recognize. And if that's given to, in experimental uh, systems to animals, and we repeatedly vaccinate with the same stalk but a different head, what we find is that each time the antibodies against the stalk increase and not the antibodies against the head. So it is possible by some rather complicated techniques to get antibodies against the stalk. 
Uh, and if we repeatedly immunize with the same stalk in a different head, we can get antibodies that will protect mice from getting flu. This hasn't yet been tested in people, uh, but this, these clinical trials will be starting over the next few years. The approach that I work on is using killer T cells, cytotoxic T cells that will recognize not the virus itself, but a cell that's been infected by that virus. So I told you the virus has to infect a cell in order to make more copies of itself. Once that happened, that cell is destined to die. The virus will kill it. But it, if, if the killer T cell, part of the immune system, can recognize that virus infected cell very quickly and kill that cell first before more copies of the virus can be produced and escaped from it, then we can stop the infection very early on. And we know that if people have a strong cytotoxic T cell response against influenza and we deliberately infect them, they don't get ill. They will have a very, very brief infection that doesn't cause any symptoms and they recover very quickly and they don't shed virus. So this is an approach that we're trying to take, um, generating cytotoxic T cells that recognize the conserved antigens, nuclear protein and matrix protein 1. Uh, and we've done some clinical trials of this approach and this uh, shows you the uh, the T cell response to those antigens that we measure in this assay, and the, the, the higher the, the bar here, the stronger this immune response. Before we vaccinate people, they do have this immune response against flu, which is from natural infection. We give them a single shot of the vaccine, and this immune response goes up about tenfold. And then over the next year, it gradually declines, and what we're working on is uh, methods for, for maintaining this at a high level for longer periods of time. But we know that this is a protective type of response and we can increase it by vaccination. We want to work on trying to maintain it at a high level for longer. Importantly, this approach works really well in older people. As the immune system gets older, what becomes very difficult is to make new immune responses to antigens, to parts of viruses that our immune system has never seen before. But we, remain, we retain our immune memory for a very long time. And what this approach to vaccination is doing is working with the immune memory and trying to expand it. So this does work very well in older adults. And this shows us uh, the results of clinical trials where we tested our vaccine in people who are 18 to 45, 50 to 59, or over 60. This is the pre-vaccination response, and this is the post-vaccination response. And all of these age groups are responding well to vaccination. There's no decline in immune response in people who get older, which is what we predicted would happen with this type of vaccine. Unlike the inactivated vaccine, which doesn't give very good immune responses in older people because we're trying to make new immune responses, and that just doesn't work so well. But what we'd really like to be able to do is combine approaches. So I've talked about antibodies to the stalk. I've talked about T cell responses to the internal antigens. Natural immunity is complex. It's not just using one immune mechanism. And if we want the best protection from a vaccine, we want the vaccine to produce more than one effective immune response. So how can we do that? Well, one problem is that most new approaches to vaccination are using different ways of doing it. So people are trying to get um, antibodies against m 2 e with protein or using inactivated virus or DNA vaccines for the anti-stalk antibodies. And we're using viral vectors for cytotoxic T cells. And if you're trying to do make different kinds of vaccines, it's not very easy to combine them. But as a first step, we have been able to combine our vaccine that boosts the T cell response with the licensed influenza vaccine, the one that people get every year, the, the trivalent inactivated vaccine. And what we did was just give two injections at the same time on the same day. Uh, ultimately, this could be formulated so people would only have to have one injection, but for the clinical trial, we gave two. And what we saw is that our T cell responses were boosted uh, whether people had just the viral vector vaccine or the trivalent inactivated vaccine at the same time. Whereas if we just gave the licensed vaccine, we saw really no change in their T-cell response. So now we're seeing that we are boosting T-cell responses. What we're seeing here is that we're also not only getting antibody responses to the inactivated vaccine, we're getting better antibody responses to the inactivated vaccine. So the light blue is the, is the change, the increase in antibody response to the H3N2, the H1N1 and the flu B from the people who just got the, the licensed vaccine. And the dark blue is the change in antibody response in the people who got both vaccines. And both, for both flu A viruses, we're seeing a, a big increase in the antibody response. So we've improved the licensed vaccine in two ways. We're adding in a T cell response and we're getting better antibody responses. So um, we hope to move on to be able to test efficacy of this vaccine uh, in, in a field trial where we va vaccinate um, half of the people with just the uh, licensed vaccine and half with both vaccines together. I'm still seeking funding to be able to do this. But in general, how do we test efficacy of new vaccines? Well, we start off by testing in animals. 
Then we test, test safety and immunogenicity. Are we getting the type of immune response that we hope to see in people in small clinical trials? And we always start with healthy people aged between 18 and 50. Um, we need to be able to measure the immune response, and there are lots of different ways of doing this, and we need to be sure that we're looking at the right thing. We can go on and do so-called influenza challenge studies, where we take a very small number of healthy volunteers, we vaccinate half of them and not the other half, and then we deliberately expose them to influenza. So this harks back to what Edward Jenner did with his gardener son when he vaccinated the boy with cowpox, and then he exposed him to smallpox by the process of variolation and showed that he didn't get ill. We can do this with flu. We're, we can do it safely in people who are under the age of 45. We wouldn't do it with older people because if they did get flu, they would be more likely to have a severe illness. So that's uh, something that we have to do in a quarantine unit the, because we don't want the flu virus that we're using in our study to be released into the community. It is always a virus that's been circulating in the community before, but we still don't want to cause a, a mini outbreak in the area. So it's very expensive to do because the volunteers have to be in quarantine for about 10 days. Uh, and it only allows us, therefore, to test very small numbers. What's more informative is to do so-called field studies where we have larger numbers of people vaccinated. Um, and in this case, half of them would have the licensed vaccine and half of them would have both vaccines. And then we just wait for natural exposure to the pathogen. So we just wait and see who gets flu during the year. And we wait uh, and we ask people to record their symptoms of flu-like illness. And we, we see if we have more flu-like illness in the group that had uh, only the licensed vaccine compared to the group that had both vaccines together. So that's the method for testing that. This is also expensive because we need to have quite large numbers of people. We can't reliably predict how many of them are going to get flu in any given winter. Uh, and some years, there's very little flu virus around. Um, so these studies are normally done in multiple locations over multiple years to try to maximise the chances of actually seeing enough flu infections to know if the vaccine works. So it's not a, a quick or easy thing to do. And we need to do lots of these studies to test efficacy against different flu viruses because if we're claiming that our vaccine is going to protect us against this year's seasonal flu and next year's and the year after, we can only demonstrate that by testing it against each of these different viruses that are circulating at different times. And if a pandemic starts, will it protect us against a new pandemic? So we need to be patient and do a lot of studies. So I just wanted to end by talking a little bit about uh, the process of taking part in clinical trials. And the, these quotes here are not about flu clinical trials, they're about Ebola vaccine trials, because we also work on Ebola vaccines in Oxford. Um, and this is in, from a news report from Lausanne, where they're testing a new type of uh, vaccine, which they hope will protect people against Ebola virus and will be then used next year in West Africa. And so a journalist wrote that um, plenty of colleagues of the principal investigator and medical students are willing to volunteer. But it seems to be more difficult to recruit participants from the broader community, those who aren't intimately involved in medical research. And so this journalist went for a walk around Lausanne and just asked people, will you take part in this trial? And these are some of the responses that he reported. One um, person who was a public accountant said, I really don't want to have an animal virus injected in my body. This disease comes from another continent. Maybe that's why I'm not really concerned about it. Uh, and he also said that the amount we're being paid for this is low for the risk you're taking. Uh, and a, a taxi driver who does come from a, a, a defective area, DRC, um, said, you could offer me a thousand times that and I'd still say no. Um, the side effects could be concerning. So I think that this kind of journalism is very, very irresponsible because this is not how we ask people to take part in clinical trials. We don't go out into the street and say, I've got a vaccine I need to test. Will you come and be part of my trial? These people are talking about risk. They have no information about the risks that they're being asked to take. They don't know how many people have been given this vaccine before. They don't know what side effects were seen. They don't know what research has been on the, done on the vaccine and what uh, will happen to them when they take part in the trial. They're just being asked, would you have this vaccine? And their gut response is, no, I won't. So let me tell you a little bit more about the process of taking part in clinical trials. Uh, and we set a lot of store by the process of informed consent. So this cartoon here is the administrator saying to the nurse behind, in front of this pile of paper, and this is the form you send back to confirm that you sent back all the other forms. And, and I put this here because there really is an awful lot of paperwork involved in, in this process. So before we can start to talk to the general public about taking part in clinical trials, we have to have all of our approvals in place. We have to have 
approval from the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, which has reviewed all the manufacturing information, all the tests that have been done on the vaccine, making sure that our vaccine isn't contaminated with anything that shouldn't be there, and how we've demonstrated that, looking at information about previous trials that have been done, if not with this vaccine, at least with similar vaccines, what animal studies have been done, they review all of that. An ethics committee reviews everything that we're going to do with the volunteers, everything that we're going to, all the information that we're going to give them. They even have to approve in advance the precise text that we use to publicise the trial. So I cannot go into the centre of Oxford and say, please come and take part in this flu vaccine trial. It's going to be great. I have to get approval for every single thing that I use to publicise the trial and then every single thing that I give as written information to the volunteers. So the first step in the process is for a potential volunteer, and note I'm calling them potential volunteers at this point, there's no guarantee that these are going to go any further forward in the process, but they respond to an advertisement to say that this trial is going to happen. And this usually gives very minimal information about the trial. So they have to get in touch with our clinical trials team, uh, and in response to that, they will get detailed ethically and regulatory approved information about the trial. So you'll get to hear a lot more about it. So I looked at the volunteer information sheet, as it's called. This is what we send out to people who are interested. This is one from our last flu trial, and it's 13 pages long, because there's a lot that we need to tell you. So it's broken into two parts. The per first part tells you why we want to do this study and what happens to you if you decide to take part. So what's the purpose of the study? How is this new vaccine different to the normal flu jab? Am I eligible? Trials will have different criteria, different age groups, um, people who are extremely healthy, sometimes the criteria for healthy is not under the care of a hospital uh, consultant, um, sometimes they're open to anybody regardless of their health status. Uh, it depends on what process we've got to in the trial and, and the first trials of a new vaccine are always tested in very healthy people between the ages of 18 and 50 and if the safety is good in then it gradually gets extended to older and younger people and people who may have some pre-existing health conditions. So we gradually get to know more and more about the, the vaccine in different sections of the population, but only if it's safe in the first trials. And then part two of this sheet tells you more about the conduct of the study, what you will have to do. You'll have to come for a screening visit. You'll have to come for a vaccination visit. You'll have to come for multiple follow-up visits. You'll have to fill in a diary card that records everything that happens to you in the first few days after the vaccination. What are the possible disadvantages and risks from taking part? And this includes things like you will have to have blood samples taken. So if you don't like having blood samples taken, then, then perhaps this wouldn't be the best thing for you to volunteer for. Um, are there any other risks? This includes all the information about how many people have been vaccinated with this vaccine before or with similar vaccines. So you get a lot to assess the risk uh, when you read one of these volunteer information sheets. And also, what will happen if I don't want to carry on with the study? And in a vaccine trial, because there's no ongoing treatment, if you don't want to carry on, then you just stop. Um, so you can withdraw at any stage. If you were sent a volunteer information sheet, clearly there's no compulsion to, to take this any further forward, but we do hope people will read them and, and think about it. And then if you're in, still interested, you need to get back in touch with the clinical trials team and say that you want to come and have a screening visit. And at that visit, you can ask as many questions as you want about anything that's on the volunteer information sheet or anything else. And you will then have blood samples taken to check that you don't have any other ongoing bloodborne infections um, and that you will be suitable to take part in the trial. And the team will then contact you uh, if you're suitable to carry on and ask you to come and book in for a vaccination visit. Now, at any point in this process, you can say that you don't want to take part. But this is after you've been given the information. And I would much rather people uh, decided that this trial is not for them once they knew about it than when they really have no idea about what's going on. So if you do want to take part, and this is our, the first volunteer in our Ebola vaccine trial in Oxford who was on the news, um, you have to sign a consent form to say that you've read and understood all the information and you, you're happy to, have, to take part in this process. Um, uh, and of course, you can, you can drop out of the trial at any stage. Uh, if I'm not recruiting for any flu vaccine trials at the moment. There are other trials going on run by the Jenner Institute and, and these are the contact details if anybody is interested. It is possible to register your interest for possible future trials but there will be very little follow-up if that's what you do. We, we will then get in touch with people when a suitable trial comes around. So um, another thing to mention is that um, we do need to test vaccines in all parts of the population. If we want to have 
flu vaccines that work better in people over the age of 65. We do have to do clinical trials in people over the age of 65 and see if they really do work better. So we have found it uh, quite easy in our trials to recruit people in their 20s and 30s. There are a lot of people who are willing to come and take part in these trials. It's been quite difficult to recruit older people, and I'm not really sure why that is. I don't know whether it's they, they just feel that maybe somebody else would do it um, or that, that it's not for them. But ultimately, if we do want to have vaccines or drugs that work better in a particular section of the population, whether it's older people or whether it's children, we do have to test those vaccines or those drugs in those sections of the population. So I would encourage all of you, if you think that we want to have better drugs and better vaccines in the future, to consider taking part in medical research. There is no compulsion, but you should find out what the research is before you just say no, because unless people say yes, we won't have any improvements. And but in the meantime, what can we do with the vaccines that we have? Well, seasonal flu can be quite a serious thing. It kills between a quarter and a half a million people every year. And these are mainly people over the age of 65. Um, as I said, the vaccine isn't 100% effective, but using a vaccine that has some efficacy is better than not vaccinating at all. It will prevent some cases of the disease, it will prevent some of the spreading of the virus, and it will mean that people who do get infected after vaccination, they tend to have milder illnesses, so they're less likely to need to go into hospital, for example. So if we could increase vaccination coverage to very high levels in the at-risk portions of the population, which is largely the over 65s, we could reduce the number of deaths and serious illnesses uh, resulting from flu virus infection. And as I said, the live attenuated virus, the nasal spray vaccine, is now being used in the children in, in Europe, including in the UK. And um, it's going well. Widespread vaccination of children, uh, if we can get enough of them, could mean that they are producing less virus and that will mean less exposures to older people and the rest of the community and potentially will have a knock-on benefit too for older adults as well, which is, uh, which is all good. So the, the main message is, um, although the vaccines that we have are by no means perfect and we want to try to make better ones, we should still be using the vaccines that we have because they are much better than not being able to use any vaccines at all. So I think I'll stop there uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions.